So, Bob Kane, what drew you to philosophy in the first place? Ah, what drew me to philosophy in the first place? That's rather hard to say. I, uh, I was very interested even in, uh, in my school days. And I read some philosophy at age 12. I read a little book, you know, they had those books at the time that were sort of uh, introductions to things for students that they could look at a field. And I read this thing at age 12 and I regarded it as very fascinating, uh, but very strange. And I didn't even agree with it then. And I only found out later who the fellow was that wrote it. It was A.J. Ayer. <laughs> And I was, I was not turned on by any means by the negativity about philosophy and what you could do with it and what you could learn from it. And I think in a way, a funny thing, uh, A.J. Ayer inspired me <laughs> to, uh, you know, really think that philosophy might have something contrary to what he was, he was having to say. But I didn't even know it was him or who he was or what right. he was at the time. I was just 12. Now, that sparked my interest, I think. But I never uh, uh, really designed myself for necessarily going into philosophy when I went to college or anything like that. I was very interested in it, but I was interested in the intellectual life. I could have majored in uh, uh, any number of things, which I did. I, as a matter of fact, I majored in German and uh, um, French literature. Uh, but uh, I was uh, at a school uh, that uh, required a lot of philosophy anyway. So I had to take Good that. Good school. <laughs> well, yeah. It was a small Catholic school in Massachusetts. A very good school, as a matter of fact, high quality. Um, and they required a lot of philosophy anyway. And it was also a little bit dull, you know, some of that old scholastic stuff and whatever. Right. But at least I got it. It was good in the history of philosophy. I got the ancient Greeks and I got the... I got the uh, uh, medievals and early modern even. I wasn't too up on modern stuff except for continental, uh, which I was interested in because of the English and the French literature. Uh, and then in my junior year, I went overseas and I studied at the University of Vienna. Huh? That was a pretty, for one year, and that was a pretty uh, uh, influential thing on me because I got more into um, uh, continental philosophy actually uh, later, I, later I was to become later I was to become an analyst, but that's a longer story. Okay, so I got into continental philosophy over there. In fact, one of my teachers, I had a lecture. It was a fairly large lecture, so I can't say I, I knew him or anything. But uh, uh, one of my lecturers was uh, uh, Victor Frankel, uh, who you may know as uh, having written *Man's Search for Being*. He had been in the uh, he had been in uh, concentration camps. And he was just out. That was 1959. Uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, well known as uh, what they called, uh, it was the existential psychiatry in those days, a kind of combination of, of the psychiatric pers uh, profession with the existentialists. And uh, he, he's very known to all those people over there. And that was an influence. I had one guy that was really ferociously for he Heidegger, uh, but I had another a Jewish professor who, even then, long before it became known over here, was very down on Heidegger. Right. And uh, uh, explained to us about his connections with the Nazis. So I was very into that uh, long before it became a thing over here in America among the various uh, thinkers. Uh, well, that was a pretty decisive thing. And then I went back to school and thought, yeah, I like this stuff, this philosophy. So I had to pick a graduate school. And the number one school at that time, which was 1960, uh, happened to be Yale. It didn't last long because there was a big breakup in the 60s later on that uh, uh, knocked it out of uh, the running. Some people retired and so on. But it was a top rated school then. Of course. And it was also big for me because it was one of the few that were known in those days as a pluralist department. Well, that has always been a, a problem uh, ever since in terms of, uh, of our academic culture. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, it was pluralist in those days. And being pluralist, of course, they had a, a, any number of very good analytic philosophers there. And uh, it turned out that uh, I went there for the pluralism, which was good for me. 
But I was attracted to whom I thought was the best philosopher there, and that was Wilfred Sellers. Uh, and uh, I worked with him a lot. I took a full year course on Wittgenstein <laughs> uh, and uh, any number of other courses with him. But I also studied with others. Um, uh, Norwood Russell Hansen was a, uh, a very well-known philosopher of science. I, yeah. I, I, really, I really liked him a lot. A few years later, of course, we know he had a tragic death in that plane accident when he was uh, flying up there, but he was an influence on me. And then a whole range of logicians, um, uh, Noel Belknap and Alan Anderson and Fred Finch, uh, Fitch, uh, and many of these guys went on with Sellers to uh, Pittsburgh very shortly, you know, at 65, 66, and so on and so forth. Uh, because of the stress, all pluralistic departments have a lot of internal stress, you know, it's very hard to hold them together. And that was happening here. And they finally all packed up and left together, including one of my uh, friends who was a graduate student at the time, Rich Thomason. Uh, he went with them. Uh, and I liked these guys and I hung out with them a lot uh, in Alan Anderson's uh, um, sweet because he was a master of one of the colleges uh, and they were at that time developing what they called relevance logic. I, I think you probably know about that, uh, but it was in the development stage then. I sat in a lot of their, their meetings and I was fascinated by them and I, I still get along. I was, I was taken by the fact that uh, later on in life uh, when uh, Belknap and several other people at Pittsburgh put out a very interesting book uh, on um, uh, time and free and uh, indeterminism. Uh, brand, they used Thomason's, Rich Thomason's branching time theory uh, of, uh, of the world uh, and added to it an uh, action theory. Now, I wish I could remember the name of that book, but it came out about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and it's a very, very good account that I can uh, uh, use in my own work, you know, about uh, how we can relate uh, indeterminism and branching time to the notion of action and how we choose and how we act and so on and so forth. But all very, very formal stuff. Um, and uh, Belknap, sent, since they... Uh, quoted me several times in the book about how this might be related to free will. <laughs> Belknap sent me a, uh, a copy of the book signed, you know, by the three guys. There was another couple of other guys, uh, more computer science oriented types that wrote it with him. Sent me a copy of the book uh, and said, you might enjoy this and we, uh, you know, you will, you will like the fact that we <laughs> uh, spoke kindly of, of your view and your notion of the intelligibility problem about free will, and thought we might have some contribution to it. Uh, but he, he had completely forgotten. So I had to write back to him. I said, well, thanks. That's great. I said, but do you know, I was a student of yours back at Yale. Huh. <laughs> and he, he had completely, he had completely forgotten. Well, it's pretty no, amazing. No, He's still doing top level work. Oh, yeah, I know. That's true. But anyway, uh, so I, I work with, um, I work with my dissertation, and by the way, there were a lot of, it, it was a, a, a diverse department. I, one of the persons I was attracted to most was Bran Blanchard. You know, that he was an old time British idealist. His guys were Bosanquet and Bradley and wow. all these guys and, and whatever. There's a Library of Living Philosophers book on Bran, and I really liked him too. So. So I, I, I like the pluralism, but I'm really, really attracted to Sellers and, and uh, work with him. Uh, and my dissertation was on intentionality in mind. And I didn't really segue to free will for a few years later, although I got interested uh, in it with him. He was a compatibilist. Yeah, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe this would be a good segue. You could, um, first of all, because uh, that time, uh, 50s, 60s, was a time where most people were compatibilists, I would say, and there were exciting uh, the debate between the compatibilists and the um, the libertarians 
uh, it seemed to be the compatibilists were winning and you've got these major papers that are, I mean, particularly um, Strawson's Freedom and Resentment, but also Frankfurt's uh, work. So maybe, maybe uh, you could, for viewers of this who aren't familiar with the main problems and because you're you know, right. you're famous for presenting all of the problems in books like this one. Yes, I, that's right. Um, uh, you could yeah. uh, yeah. sort of lay out perhaps what compatibilism is and then the major problems for it. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good. Uh, and uh, indeed, this was, by the way, a period between 60 and 64 when I was there working with Sellers. Uh, and uh, as I've often said in my writings, the, the, the landscape of the free will issue was very different in those days because, for one thing, you were coming off a strong logical positive tradition which which regarded the problem as a pseudo problem because it was all about freedom of action and there were no particular uh, difficult philosophical issues about freedom of action there were a lot of issues uh, uh, but uh, and and the whole question of determinism was a non-starter don't worry about it uh, it's not a problem for free will and compatibilists therefore were people who thought in in the words of Dan Dennett that uh, uh, we could have all the freedom worth wanting even if determinism were true. So in other words, determinism being the view that uh, the complete state of, if you could have a snapshot of the complete state of the universe at any moment and you knew all of the laws of the universe, you could map out the entire future of the universe thenceforth, it, including every action that any uh, being would take in that time. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. But I, I usually don't put it that way. I put it in a simpler way, which I think is more historically accurate, going all the way back to the Stoics and many, many others. And that is that determinism is the view that given the past at any time and the laws governing the universe, there is only one possible future. Uh, that would mean that the alternative in determinism is the view that at least at some times, given the past at some times in the history of the universe and the laws governing it, uh, there's more than one possible future. Okay, but of course, uh, I mean, so nowadays, nowadays... You, um, uh, the picture, the garden of forking paths kind of picture, you know, there. Yeah. Nowadays, I mean, compatibilists want to say there's still possible there's right. other possible worlds, it's just that uh, they have slightly different laws from ours. Yeah, well, uh, yes, uh, they might say that, and they, they also say that uh, um, it doesn't, uh, I mean, free will is compatible with determinism. I mean, if it should turn out to be uh, indeterminism in the universe, I mean, if quantum theory, the indeterministic interpretation of quantum theory should be right, Compatibilism, in their view, is still the right view uh, because it wouldn't matter. Uh, in fact, indeterminism would cause a problem because it would make it uncertain. What you were doing, it would mean you would lose control. I mean, in some ways, you could say that Hume was not a compatible, was not a determinist because he didn't think you could bring necessity and possibility into the description of the laws. Uh, if the laws weren't necessary, well, then maybe there might be a different future. Uh, uh, but uh, Hume was a compatibilist because he thought that wouldn't be of any help to free will whatsoever. Uh, because if we're going to decide something, it has to be that that decision comes out of, of our best reasons and whatever and the way we are at the time. And if it doesn't, uh, it's not really free and a responsible action. It'll be an accident or something, you see. So, uh, so a lot of modern, modern compatibilists now taking uh, quantum theory seriously um, um, say, well, uh, we're not denying uh, uh, that uh, determinism might be false. But it doesn't really matter for the free will issue because it, uh, we have free will with, with determinism anyway, and indeterminism wouldn't be any help as some people like to put it, with free will anyway. So they are still compatibilist, and basically the idea is uh, that the uh, we can have all the freedoms worth wanting uh, 
uh, even if determinism were true. Right. So, uh, and, so for example, uh, I find this very compelling. I think it's in the water in Britain. I think if you're British, you have to be a compatibilist, or at least uh, right. for the most part. And so I, that that always made perfect sense to me that, um, you know, so Locke and Mill uh, and Hume and all those guys are, are basically compatibilists. And the position being that I want what I want out of freedom is I want control. I want it to be the case. I consider my action free if it's what I wanted or what I desired or what uh, and combined with my beliefs. So if I'm in control of my action, that's what's important about freedom. And when so not being free is when somebody else is forcing me to do something either by holding a gun to me or by brainwashing me or whatever. But it must be the case that um, to be free, I have to be in control, which requires determinism, because if things happen at random, then I could want to move my arm and then suddenly my arm flies off in another direction. And that's not freedom. That's, in fact, absence of freedom. So yes. I was was found very compelling the the randomness complaint uh, against libertarianism. But you, you have a response to that, or at well, least you have a way of dealing with that. It's an extremely powerful complaint, and it comes under many forms, you know, luck, chance, accident, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I do have a response to it, but before I get to there, let's stick with the 1960 situation. Okay. With, with, where I, I say that in those days, and it's still the case today, compatibilism was the default position for everybody every philosopher who took science seriously right. didn't want to appeal to mystery. And libertarians uh, at that time, all of them, uh, had some kind of mysterious or obscure account of things. I mean, going way back to Kant with a noumenal world, you know, because somehow we can't make sense of it in the deterministic universe. Uh, uh, a, a Cartesian with a immaterial soul, uh, or, or, or down to modern times in, in the 50s and 60s, uh, it was uh, some sort of agent causation theory where there was a special kind of agent cause that couldn't in principle be caused uh, itself by prior events. As Ch Chisholm had a view like that, didn't he? Uh, absolutely. Rod Chisholm was a big guy there. And Seller's arguments with Chisholm about the nature of mind and how it worked was part of my dissertation. So, I mean, and I had a great admiration for Chisholm as a philosopher, too. But he held this view, uh, this aging causation view, as did others. Uh, and then there were even views that, uh, so-called non-causalist views, views that, you know, well, uh, its volitions just can't be caused and things like that. And uh, in his famous essay, which you mentioned in 1962, uh, Freedom and Resentment, Strawson um, uh, spoke here very nicely and influentially about the fact of what he called all of these views were the quote unquote panicky metaphysics of libertarianism, right? Uh, and that was the usual assumption. If you, assi if you had a sci scientifically oriented person, whatever, you had to be a compatibilist. Uh, and otherwise, you had to engage in some kind of crazy panicky metaphysics. You have to postulate extra entities and so on. And I liked neither of those options. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that was my initial getting into this with Sellers, even though I didn't do it in my dissertation. Wise, with, wise move. Don't do it with, don't get it, into it with your advisor when you're writing your dissertation. Because for one thing, he admired uh, Strawson's essay. Freedom and resent. He writes Strawson generally because Sellers had made this distinction between the manifest image of humans in the world and the scientific image, which is a, uh, had been an influential distinction ever since. And the manifest image is what we now think of as folk psychology, folk intuitions, the way we normally think about it, and the scientific image as well, uh, what we understand science to be, whatever that is. Uh, and uh, uh, his view was that. Um, we have mixed intuitions in the manifest image. Many of them are compatibilist. And there are some that are in libertarian, <laughs> incompatibilist, libertarian, uh, uh, and so on. But when you move over to the scientific image, you can't make any sense of the libertarian intuitions, even though they might be over here. So you've got to drop them 
and being a scientific realism that was realist that was the issue for him <clears throat> and it's interesting that he took Strawson's book individuals as a prime example of the uh, uh, manifest image <clears throat> in general and so freedom and resentment was just part of that whole picture well I went into his office one day and I was very started, interested in the problem I was thinking of writing a paper on it uh, for the course uh, and I said to him not well I'm not sure I said I think we can make sense of free will in the scientific image uh, and that still is my that has been my project for 40 years because that's really what I'm doing I, I completely eschew and I, 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 I reject and I don't think adequate any of the panicky metaphysics of traditional so, so I, I just throw those things out the window. What can we do without them? That was my question. So, what so I went into Seller's office one day, talked to him about a paper I was doing and I said um, uh, that I was going to try to show that uh, that you could actually make sense of a libertarian free will uh, without, uh, within a scientific context without appealing to mystery and so on. Uh, and I said, and he, he was very doubtful, he gave me a tough time in there, and, uh, and I said to him, okay, I'll be back in three weeks with an answer, and he <laughs> left and went back and to- 40 reading. years later, you're, you're yeah. nearly there. Right, he went back to reading his Sports Illustrated. Uh, then, like the usual brash and naive graduate student at the door, I turned around and said, or at least by the end of the semester. <laughs> so anyway, that was how, that was kind of how it all started. And as I often joke, as you just put it nicely, 40, 45 years later, I'm still at it. Uh, so it wasn't so easy, but it was certainly invigorating. So anyway, so go, uh, go ahead then with your... That right, the... the um... It. What, wh why can't you be happy with compatibilism? So, as, as you said, Dennett likes to say, gives us all the freedom worth wanting. Apparently, you want more. What is yeah. the more you want? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I, I can put it a number of ways. You can come at it either from the point of view of freedom or from the point of view of responsibility. Um, and uh, uh, let, me just, let me start with the responsibility side. Uh, just for the for the moment, because it's uh, I think a good side. Uh, I believe there are two dimensions of responsibility. Uh, the first dimension is the obvious one that compatibilists and everybody can capture and understand, and that is responsibility for expressing in action the will you have, where we understand the will here in a broad sense to mean. Uh, your character traits, your motives, your emotions, your feelings, any of those di complex sets of dispositions that incline you to act in one way or another. That's what the will, one of the meanings of will historically. So the first dimension of responsibility is uh, responsibility for expressing in action the will you have without constraint, without anybody preventing you, without coercion, whatever. So it really comes from your own self. That is the view, uh, that is the kind of responsibility that compatibilists, that dimension, is what they get and what they want. Uh, and it's very important, and I don't deny it for a minute. Uh, but I don't believe, I believe there's a second dimension of responsibility that we are concerned with in life, in many practical contexts, but even beyond that, uh, in the courtroom, for example, or whatever. And that is, I, that's a second dimension of responsibility, which I call responsibility for having the will uh, that you express in action. So we have responsibility for, uh, uh, responsibility for expressing the will you have in action and responsibility for having the will you express in action. Right. So uh, the, first the, the example that, Dennett uses, and I don't know if he was the first to use this, but uh, is uh, the one of Martin Luther who says, who famously said, here I stand, I can do no other. Now, what Dennett wants to contend is that the fact that he, let's take him literally, right. you know, probably it's not true, but let's take him literally that he cannot do otherwise than what he did. 
because of the nature of his character and his will. His, right. So in that case, his character and his will completely determine his action. Okay. Nonetheless, we regard him as free. So then it says, voila, that's good enough. Whereas you want to say is, no, what we require is that the character that determines his action, he has to have had some kind of role in shaping that character. Because if it was just handed to him or if it was created by others, then he wouldn't be free. No, that's well put. And that's the way I answered Dennett in any number of writings on this score. Uh, I, I point out that I do not deny that he could have been uh, responsible and completely responsible, uh, even if he was determined by his existing will at that time. Uh, but uh, th that would be, on my view, to the degree that in the process of his past life, he had brought himself to a state where uh, he had that will that he had then. And indeed, I, I think if we look at, at uh, Luther's biography, uh, we see the many struggles he went through and the conflicts he had to undergo uh, where I believe he could have gone down different paths, but he didn't. And he brought himself to this point. I mean, if anybody struggled, because I see, you see, I, I see that, that getting that deeper sense of having the will or, or creating your own will or forming your own will is what I mean by free will. Uh, and it occurs in, in occasions which I call self-forming actions. And these are actions which arise when there are various conflicts in our lives where we could, we, we, we have good reasons for going either way and we have to decide between them. So, uh, so in those situations of conflict, um, it, I, I, I argue, uh, I'll say more about this later, but I argue that uh, what happens is that the, the conflict and the difficulty in the choice stirs up a certain amount of indeterminism from the synaptic levels in the brain. And actually, uh, that indeterminism is amplified by the nonlinear processing in the brain, which is very well accepted. Uh, it's sort of, it's not exactly chaos all the time, but it's the, that's the idea. And, it, it, and we know that the brain gets worked up in situations of conflict. So we get that stirring up of conflict in the brain. And so the uncertainty we feel phenomenologically uh, is reflected in an actual indeterminism in our neural processes. That's the I, way. I can quote you. There is a tension and uncertainty in our minds at such times of inner conflict, which are reflected in appropriate regions of our brains by movement away from thermodynamic equilibrium. There's your scientific realism. In yeah. short, a kind of stirring up of chaos in the brain that makes it sensitive to micro indeterminacies at right. a neuronal level. As a result, the uncertainty and inner tension we feel at such soul-searching moments of self-formation is reflected in the indeterminacy of our neural processes themselves. What is experienced phenomenologically as uncertainty corresponds physically to the opening of a window of opportunity that temporarily, temporarily screens off complete determination from by the past. And that last part, uh, presumably, is your response to the consequence argument uh, as it is now yeah. Re yeah. referred to. That's right. That's right. So, uh, um, yes, that's very good. I don't know whether you were reading that or you... <laughs> yeah, I was reading it. It's a, it's a quote from you. And so on. But I, I say I was gonna hire, I'm going to hire this guy. <laughs> but uh, in any case, yeah, that's the idea. The only thing I would change there now is I would leave out the chaos because it doesn't necessarily require chaos, which is a tricky, complicated business. But rather... Uh, all you need is, is non-linearity in the processing of the brain because it will amplify minor things and so on. That's been made by a number of recent philosophers of science. That point has been made. And it's very well known. There's some debate about the extent to which chaos plays a role in the brain, although it's often thought so. Uh, but uh, uh, there's this widespread acknowledgement that the, uh, uh, the brain is non-linear in its, in its functioning. And that's good enough to amplify minute quantum indeterminacies if the occasion arises. Even in one of the more really hard-nosed uh, uh, neuroscientists around, uh, Christoph Koch, uh, who's very well known and so on, and he denies all the kind of ex, uh, 
extravagant views about how indeterminism might be in the brain and be the source of consciousness and Penrose and, and some of these other people. Uh, he's skeptical of all those views, but he said the one thing that you cannot rule out is that minute quantum indeterminacies at the synaptic level or in the neurons and so on might at times be amplified in the neural processing in the brain, and that's where we might get the randomness that is well known to occur there. Okay, so... He says that's, that's a part, and, and for my view, on other views, you need some wilder things, you know, like quantum collapses that involve the whole brain. On my view, that's all you need. So, uh, uh, when you say self-forming actions, there seems to be uh, two senses of this. And the first sense is um, that the self or the will um, the, the thing that, you know, the thing, for example, that determines Martin Luther to, to nail the theses to the door. Um, so you're talking, the self must be formed for it uh, to be free. So that's the one sense that the, the self is the thing being formed. But then at the same time, you also want to say, it must be me that's doing it. So the yeah. self is both formed and former. It's yeah. for me and for me, which sounds like bootstrapping, which sounds yeah. impossible. Well, no, no, it isn't because you see the self can be, the, the self could have been formed by the, uh, uh, by the past, by the upbringing, by the genes, the environment, in the normal way that people think about that. But, but it's formed in such a way, I would say, uh, that at certain points uh, in life, uh, the, the will and the structure of the brain and, and the structure of the self is such that we enter into complex situations in which um, more than one option is consistent with the way our self has been so far been formed. And even if our self so far been formed is... is uh, has is completely determined we can encounter situations in which that determined self is actually now torn between different things and we come to a crossroads because each of these things are consistent with our existing will with everything we are you know my my prime my example I often use and it's often quoted and discussed is I have a businesswoman are uh, going to a meeting, and you're, you're undoubtedly familiar with that. And she's very ambitious, and she's got to get to this meeting, and she's afraid her boss will be angry with her if she doesn't make it on time. She sees an assault in an alley. Well, she also thinks of herself as a moral person. Nobody else is around. If she doesn't alert the police and stop and get some help uh, or something, uh, you know, this bad act will take place. Uh, but then she'll be late to the meeting, and she imagines the boss, and she might even lose her job. This is such a crucial meeting. Uh, and so she is torn in that way. Uh, now, um, uh, those are the kind of situations, I think, where she could go either way, and her will is torn uh, uh, either way, and she makes a choice, and that choice is a forming choice for her, because as Aristotle says, you make enough of these over time, uh, you you make enough Im immoral acts over time, you become an immoral person. You make enough, and he, and Aristotle says in answer to objections about that 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 uh, uh, only a fool would fail to realize that if you go on doing selfish things, you're going to become a selfish person, whole whole hog, and the other way around. Uh, and uh, this is what happens. Now it does follow that my notion of developing or forming the will is a matter of degree. Uh, and it's, I, I believe a number of things about free will as I understand, it's very limited because we are very much influenced by heredity and environment and so on. Uh, and that's where the, the science part comes in. Uh, you see, the, the traditional notion of appealing to uh, uh, extra, you know, panicky metaphysics, uh, so to speak, was to get us outside of the scientific nexus and somehow be able to do, uh, to act quite independently of those influences on us. And I regard, I think one, one aspect of uh, trying to make sense of this within science is to realize that free will is a very limited thing. It's not an all or nothing affair. At any given time, we're always hemmed in by these possibilities. Now, 
there's a big debate uh, that people bug me about. Uh, uh, there are many. There are so many I, I can hardly even list them. Uh, but one is, well, what about the first SFAs of childhood? What happens there? And I have a view about that. It's a very, very good point. Uh, when do they start and how do they start? Because clearly when they start, you do have what that idea that you put forward, that we are totally determined at that point. Uh, uh, well, how do they start? Well, I, I suspect they start somewhere between two and three. Having raised children, you probably have yourself. Uh, I suspect they start at age somewhere between two and three when the child begins to question whether they should do what mommy says or take the cookies or, or this or that. So, and What mommy or what tummy? Yeah, yeah, mommy or tummy, good, I like that. Uh, and, uh, and you see that happening, beginning to happen there. Uh, and I think that's where the first SFAs begin. I once gave a talk of this at some university or other and when I said this, it, this happens a lot. When I said this, the chairman of the department says, oh, no, wait a minute. He said, I, I've, got a, I've got a little one there who's less than two years old, and he's already doing it. Uh, he says he used to sit up on his high chair and swish all that food right off, no problem. But now he looks at me before he does it, <laughs> and I know he's thinking, should I, do, should I upset daddy or should I do what I want to do? And I said, okay, well, I guess, well, you got a very bright boy there. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so he insists. And it, it's funny, I, I often get that from parents who have said, well, but my child <laughs> does it earlier than that. Uh, Little do they know, though, that, uh, you know, right. they, they should allow their child the bliss of uh, irresponsibility for a little bit longer. Yeah, I know. There's a, there's They're advocating for child prisons. Well, there are two, two sides to that. So, so, but here's, here's the other point about this. this is, it's very interesting to speculate about this because my view is that in those first SFAs, the responsibility is very minimal, almost infinitesimal. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's crazy like this woman who took her child to the, to, down to the police department and threatened uh, jail with him to straighten him out, you know. And oh, that happened to Hitchcock. Apparently that's why he was always, he was uh, terrified uh, of the police because his uh, dad did that to him when he was a kid. There you go. Now that, that, that is truly absurd. Uh, uh, that is truly absurd. But it's not off the map to have minor punishments like, uh, you know, no uh, uh, go to your room or no... Uh, uh, dessert tonight, you know, or little things and so on, because it's, in my view, it's equally a mistake for parents not to hold the children responsible at all at a very early age, because if you do that, they will not develop a will of their own formation and, and, uh, and any kind of discipline about these matters. So there's two mistakes here. One is to think we're not responsible at all for these things and not to be held so by by parents uh, and the other uh, uh, that we're you know kind of somehow totally responsible which is which is absurd so I believe that responsibility is very limited at that age and and it it is limited all along throughout our life but it develops over time as we make more and more SFAs if a child is still uh, doing these things at age eight, nine, ten, twelve, then you might have a problem. Uh, yeah, think. I mean, um, here's something that occur that has occurred to me in thinking about this. Um, it seems one of the things that is a matter of kind of brute luck, let's say, or genetics, or whatever, is how shapeable yourself is. So, for example, it might be the case that some people are um, very, very hard to... So, so, for example, if they choose probity in one instance, this won't necessarily take. In right. other words, uh, you know, it's as if they're made of very hard rock and somebody's trying to shape their, their character and it just sort of bounces off. So, now, on your view, it looks like they will then be exposed to more uh, self-forming actions. There will be a series of self-forming actions because 
uh, it won't be the case that they'll be diverted into one kind of character trait. They'll oh. still have both options just as much. Oh, okay. All right. Now, uh, it, yes, there are going to be people like this. And in, at, at the extreme on this spectrum, of course, is you have psychopathy, you have uh, psychopaths. Uh, and uh, just as I say, it's a matter of degree, that degree can go to zero. <laughs> Uh, in some cases, you know, Gary Watson has this wonderful article, Responsibility and the Limits of Evil, on this uh, serial killer, uh, Robert Harris, uh, on death row in California, uh, whose uh, uh, father rejected him because he thought the mother was pregnant from another guy. Uh, and the mother didn't want to lose the father, so she re rejected him from an early age. He tried to come up to her. She would push him away. And we have to have enough human sense, I think, to realize that uh, his ability to develop a character of his own other than the vicious person he came is, is very limited, probably minimal. And this is what should happen in the so-called punishment phases of criminal trials. We focus on the first dimension of responsibility. Did he do it? Did it come from his will? Was he coerced or whatever in the guilt phase? Uh, although I, I wouldn't like to use that word alone, because I think guilt is, applies to both. But then in the punishment phase, we begin to look into the history of, of the person, and we, may, and we may mitigate the punishment. This is interesting, because if I'm right about it's being a matter of degree, then talking about mitigating punishment, and even in some cases reducing it to zero, uh, uh, is, it, it is relevant and apt. And appropriate. Um, and uh, so I stress that very much. As a matter of fact, I have a, a little saying uh, that in an ideal world, we wouldn't make judgments about moral responsibility at all. We would leave them all to God. It would have to be or some omniscient being, uh, you see. Uh, and that, that is a, my own expression of the limitations we would feel here. Uh, and, and so my, my view is that uh, I tell a story like Watson's and in his recent book, John Nichols, who has written a nice book on this, and he, he discusses my example and, and Watson's on this about a trial. Uh, and uh, uh, my own example comes from uh, uh, personal stuff in our neighborhood. A young man had, uh, had uh, assaulted and raped a young young girl and we knew the young girl's family and, uh, and we went to the trial and whatever and so on and uh, uh, you know clearly he was guilty and he was a vicious young man and you listen to the whole story and it's clear uh, that he did it he did it of his own will it was, it was an ill will it was a vicious will but he did it of his own will and uh, all the evidence pointed in that direction uh, and then when they started uh, uh, going through the punishment phase and looking at, at this thing, most of us there um, began to feel that the punishment ought to at least be mitigated because of the horrible circumstances uh, that we would describe, something like uh, Watson's uh, Robert Harris mm -hmm. story. And that happened to most of us. And then some people say, well, that happened to you because you're a philosopher, you know, and you, no, no way. I, all uh, our neighbors were there, my wife and myself, and, and they were, you know, over here we have a football coach and, and across the street a businesswoman and a computer guy here. The guy next door is an inventor of Yeti coolers. And, <laughs> and you know, they're, they're ordinary folk. But they all were like us saying, oh, I don't know, this kid had a really rough time. Yeah. Uh, and we should mitigate. And then my, my, my thought is, if there are any people in that courtroom who were not at, moved at all by the story of the kid's upbringing and his past, but said, no, no, he did it, he's a vicious bastard, we're mm -hmm. gonna put him away, then what I say is, I wouldn't want those people anywhere near a jury uh, de deciding the fate of anybody I loved or cared about or anybody whatever. That's the line I, I use at that point. Uh, that, so that's why I feel strongly about this other dimension of freedom, how we got to be uh, responsibility for having the particular will that we do have. 
Uh, and in answer to Dennett on this Loesler example, which I have discussed on a number of occasions, is I, I agree with, with Dennett that, um, yes, Luther could have been fully and totally responsible for this act, even if he was totally determined at the moment of doing it. Uh, it might be the most responsible act of his whole life. Um, but I would still say that he would be so to the degree that through many self-forming actions in his past, he had made himself into the kind of person he was then. Uh, so that's the line. I'm going to quote you again. <laughs> if there were no such undetermined uh, self-forming actions in our lifetimes, there would have been nothing we could have ever voluntarily done to make ourselves different than we are. A condition yeah. that I think, you, is inconsistent yes. with our having the kind of responsibility for being what we are, which genuine free will requires. Yes, sir. So, um, I'm going to push you a little bit on this. Uh -huh. it, it... Can I interpose? A, oh, sure. Sorry. One further distinction here. Uh, don't forget your. Don't forget your point. I won't. But when I when I give you these two dimensions of responsibility. The first one is the one that compatibilists capture, uh, and it's related to what I call to, to freedom of action. This is the freedom to express your will in action. It's the second dimension that I say is related to freedom of will. So I distinguish freedom of action, freedom of will. And there are, so there are many freedoms, and indeed there are a whole spectrum of freedoms of action. Five freedom. freedoms, you say, in the last chapter of this I, I do. one. In the last chapter, I have five, and that's... Yeah. I, I read that the other day, anticipating this thing, and I, I, I said, gee, this is pretty damn good. <laughs> but that they are worth discussing, by the way, because they all have a role in the history of the debates of, of the problem. Uh, but in any case, I distinguish freedom of action and uh, freedom of will. And freedom of will is connected with the second dimension responsibility, uh, uh, and uh, freedom of action is uh, with the first. And the way I see the development of modern thought, you know, with Locke and, and Hobbes and Hume and, and other people like this, is to say, oh, no, the will, that was some notion of the medievals, you know, outdated now, not fit for modern science. We've got to focus on freedom of action and the freedom of the agent. That's what Locke said. And in a way, he's right if he means the problem isn't about the freedom of the will. The problem is about the freedom of agency, said Locke. And he's absolutely right, except my answer is the freedom of agency has two dimensions, namely the freedom of action and the freedom of will. And it's that second dimension of freedom, free agency that has caused all the problems down through history. No one would have a problem about freedom of action. Compatibilists co cover that one. Now, when it comes to freedom of will, compatibilists say, well, but we can't have that anyway because of this ultimacy business and the regresses and, and the luck and the chance and all the rest of it. Okay, I buy it. I realize there are very serious problems here and you have to make sense of this freedom of will. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but it is different than freedom of action. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, so that's the, I have a sort of two-pronged point. The, the first point is, um, why can't it be the case that a compatibilist could say, I absolutely agree with you that you've got to have freedom of action and you've got to have this freedom of self-formation, but I can give a compatibilist account of self-formation. Right. That, um, that I, I mean, for example, that seems to be Mill's view. Mill does seem to uh, have the view that you can change the way you are by working at it. Right, right. Well, uh, yes, and, and that is a, that is a very, very common thing. But the question is, at every juncture, when you are supposedly uh, changing the way you are, uh, uh, the question is, uh, could you have done otherwise than change your way in the way you did? And if determinism was true, the answer has got to be no. Okay. So that brings in the requirement for indeterminism. I mean, uh, granted, we are constantly changing ourselves, so we have that feeling of doing it. But uh, if indeed our, the change we make in ourselves at any given time is in fact determined by, by our past, then, you know, we don't have it. Uh, uh, we don't have freedom of will in the sense in which I understand it. But you're absolutely right. Uh, some compatibles try to 
capture this notion. Some don't, by the way. Uh, uh, Henry, Harry Frankfurt doesn't worry about it. This is often said to be a historical dimension to freedom, and some compatibles say, no, we've got to have that. John Fisher, for example, is, thinks we must have it, and Mike McKenna uh, thinks we, we might have it, and so on. But there are some, like, like Frankfurt, that are very adamant. No, in fact, I'll tell you a story about Frankfurt. Uh, in the 1980s, I wrote him a letter. Okay, uh, just the, I'm still a reasonably young philosopher, of course, and great admiration for him. He's influential. And I said to him, you know, I said, the usual objection to your view is that your view is that we have free will when we are wholeheartedly committed to what we're doing so that our whole self is behind what we do. That, by the way, is what I call freedom of self-perfection in the final chapter there. Okay. So we're wholeheartedly committed to doing what we want to do, and there's no ambivalence. That's when we truly have a free will. And, and uh, uh, the usual argument against him by Watson and any number of others is a standard kind of regress type of thing saying, but wait a minute, uh, are, we re uh, are we responsible for, uh, uh, you know, becoming wholehearted <laughs> uh, or, or what? And that's a good objection, I think. That's an important objection. But I had another one that no one had ever made. Uh, and it's been repeated a few times, but I sent it to him in this letter. I said, you know, I said, I gave the regular objection. I said, this is what bo another thing bothers me, however. If free will is what you mean, then we never can get from ambivalence to wholeheartedness of our own free will. Because we wouldn't have free will till we got there. Right. Okay. And he said, because you see, I see, I think ambivalence is crucial to free will. It's a conflict, and ambivalence means ambivalence. There must be points in life when we really are ambivalent, and we could go either way, given our whole past. Uh, and ambivalence really means, which he, which Frankfurt throws out the window, he hates, um, is the key, in my mind, to free will. Not necessarily free action, but free will. Um, and, uh, and, uh, he, resp he re took a few weeks to respond because this was letter writing in those days right. before email. I often tell student audiences that this was a time you don't remember. It was just after the last ice age. Right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he responded in a very straightforward way. It was amazing. He said, well, you know, he said, many think people think I'm crazy, but I don't think it matters one whit how we got to be uh, the way we are, whether what matters is whether we're wholehearted. Uh, it could have come about by a combination of luck and past circumstances and our upbringing and so on. What really matters is not how we got there, but what we are, because wholeheartedness is a great thing, and it's a great thing to attain. Uh, and that was his answer. It was pretty straightforward, it was pretty honest, and whatever. But clearly it was a total rejection of the historical. Uh, dimension. So, so not all of, of them do uh, this, and Frankfurt was pretty straightforward about this. Uh, but some realize that there's there's a bit of an issue here, uh, and so they want to make sense of it. And Fisher's one, McKenna's another. Watson struggled with it too, I think. Uh, all these people aren't compatible, mind you. So they had to deal with it some way. But but so you can go back to your question. Yeah. Um so, so they want to try to make sense of our making because we obviously do. Uh, go ahead. Anyway. It seems like uh, with your self-forming actions, you're doing two things at once. Um, because if I'm, uh, I want to say that compatibilists think they can give self-forming actions, and you say they're not good enough. And the reason you say they're not good enough is because, um, because. They have to, there has to be this could have done otherwise element, which is where in determinism comes in, which is where you, you uh, point to quantum mechanics as, as a scientific basis for indeterminism. Um, so it seems like you're doing two things. Uh, you're providing uh, for formation of the will while at the same time responding to the consequence objection. The, the, this view that yeah. if, if determinism is true, then nothing is up to us. Yes. 
so so you're sort of baking the indeterminism in to the self formation and that's what your um plural voluntary uh control notion yeah i call that plural voluntary control because on my view uh and this is not true of all uh, incompatibilists it isn't just a matter indeterminism is nowhere near enough to get us free will you need really two conditions you need the fact that the the, the choices are undetermined could go either way but that you have a kind of control over them such that either way they go uh, you had you have the power to voluntarily intentionally and rationally go that way or voluntarily intentionally and rationally go that way so because that, that way what you're doing I, there is you're blocking off the kind of randomness objection that the uh, uh, that the compatibilists right. say you know right. If but things answer, just happen to me, then I wouldn't the, be free. Whereas you're saying, either way I go, it will be something that I would fully endorse. Right. Now, that, that's the idea to block off the uh, randomness objection. But uh, it doesn't just, just, just saying that doesn't block it off because it's a hell of a job trying to explain how you can have plural voluntary control over these outcomes, uh, given that they are undetermined. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where all the work begins. But this requirement is there, and the re one reason for making it is that you can imagine situations, I mean, John Austin imagined this years ago, as did Elizabeth Hanscom and so on, in which uh, you, uh, indeterminism does in fact function uh, in our choices, but it isn't anything like free will. Uh, for example, I use this example, if you go up to a coffee machine, intending to press the button for coffee with uh, black coffee uh, and because of some uh, indeterminism in your neural processes either in the brain or in the arm you press the wrong button uh, that's undetermined right but supposing that it was undetermined you could have pressed the wrong button and you press the right button uh, then uh, you did it and you were free and it was voluntary intentional and rational uh and you could have done otherwise but that's not anything like what we mean by free will so it's not uh, what i i i caution libertarians and incompatibles about just talking about could have done otherwise that's not good enough it's could have done otherwise voluntarily rational and, and intentionally could have gone more than one way. This, this is what I mean by plural voluntary control. Uh, and you, uh, you need that because just being able to do otherwise. Now, what I, uh, when I said that coffee machine example, you know that J.L. Austin had the classic example. He talked about a three-foot putt, mm -hmm. which he might miss. And he says, you know, it was undetermined, but I hit it. Uh, and that still means I did it, even though it was undetermined. And I'm responsible for doing it. Now, now I play on that idea too, by the way. But um, the point is that uh, uh, indeterminism just isn't enough to deal with the could have done otherwise issue. Uh, so that's worth making too. So I, so you're right. I have this plural voluntary control and and indeterminism. You need those two things together for SFAs. Now. Um by the way, you don't need them for other free will choices like Luther's later on, right? Right, but if it were the case, it is your view that if it were the case that if Luther had no SFAs in his history, then right. his, his, here I stand, I could know another, actually wouldn't be free. That is, you have no, to be... It would be, it would be a, a, an act of freedom, free action. It would be definitely a free if, if all the other compatibilist conditions were satisfied. He wasn't coerced at the time. Right. He wasn't compulsively acting. Uh, he he was doing it intentionally. He knew exactly what he was doing. He you know the he, all those compatibilist conditions are absolutely important. In fact, they're important for my own SFAs. You have to satisfy those conditions as well in my FS, SFAs, but they're not enough because you got to have the plural voluntary control too but uh, those conditions are absolutely crucial and they also are a very necessary element in responsibility uh, because we just happen to uh, Dennett happens to assume all that with Luther in this case as do most of us because it did seem to be that none of these other conditions held uh, so uh, yeah uh, 
there there have to be these these conditions and these are the conditions for freedom of action and responsibility in the first dimension and i don't underplay this it's an interesting thing about incompatibilist views of free will they presuppose compatibilist views as an essential part of them the opposite of course does not hold uh, so i don't underestimate all of the compatibilist thoughts here about what it amounts to and it's necessary but to me it's not sufficient for what i call ultimate responsibility yeah i think um if you don't, if you don't have the could uh, i um self formation perhaps uh, uh you know this uh but someone who's taken uh, a view uh, taken your view or at least a view very like yours and applied it in a kind of interesting way in a philosophy of religion uh, question, I, I, I mentioned this before, uh, is a guy called James Sennett. And he wrote this paper. Um, briefly, it's about whether or not we're free in heaven. Because, of course, this is a puzzle with regard to the problem of evil. If, you know, the usual response to the problem of evil is the free will defense right. or the free will theodicy, where they say, yes, God is all powerful and all loving, but. Uh, the reason why there's evil is because he gave us this undetermined free will. So it has to be libertarian free will, because if it's consequentialist free will, then he could have right. set up the laws of the universe so that we were we we were caused to always act good, uh, act in a good way. So it has to be libertarian free will. And that's why we do evil on Earth. But, but then people the obvious question is, but wait a minute, what about in heaven? In heaven, are there going to be people murdering in heaven? Are there going to be people doing evil things? And they say, they want to say, no, in heaven, you always do good. Well, but then wait a minute. If heaven is supposed to be the best possible place, uh, do, does that mean we're not free in the best possible place? Well, that undercuts your whole free will defense because what's the value of giving us freedom if we don't have it in heaven? It's obviously not such a great thing. So the puzzle is you have to both say, we are free in heaven because uh, otherwise freedom isn't the great value. It doesn't have the great value it needs to be for the free will defense. But you've also got to say somehow we don't do evil. But you've also got to say, and yet we do evil on earth because of freedom. And his ingenious suggestion is that uh, the freedom we have on earth is f uh, the kind of freedom of self formation. But when we get to heaven, we have fully formed cells and we no longer need to form them anymore because they're perfect. So we will just be like Luther and, you know, we can do no otherwise than the good that we do. So you can see it's kind of an ingenious use of. Well, I, I it is. It is. And it's uh, it's exactly what I would try to say here if I said anything. Now, I try to be a little cautious on the religious dimensions of all of this for obvious reasons because it's like jumping out of the frying pan into the fire uh, but that's the direction I would go and I would refer you here once again that you you showed that last chapter I have of my contemporary introduction of free will I distinguish five freedoms there uh, the first three are compatibilist freedoms and that two are uh, um, libertarian freedom right the first the first is self-realization and that is the ability to realize the self you have or the will you have in action that's the one we understand that's the usual compatibilism the second one is a, is a freedom of reflective self-control uh, which a number of compatibilists have put forward including Frankfurt and others uh, and that's a legitimate kind of freedom too and the, but the third third compatibilist freedom is the interesting one it's the freedom of self perfection and this is the freedom of the as i put it of the saints in heaven if you wanted an image of it uh, who cannot do uh, wrong because their will is formed in such a way that they are unable uh, to uh, do evil and by the way it would seem that that must be the freedom god has too in a religious context right. Uh, so you need that freedom of self-perfection idea. It's interesting if you look at the history of free will debate, you find a tremendous amount of confusion about this because many people who've talked about, you know, even Augustine, at a certain point he comes to a point of, of saying, well, yeah, we could have 
uh, perfect freedom, and it turns out to be the freedom of self-perfection. And a lot of these people don't, do, discussing these religious things historically, do not distinguish the freedom of self-perfection from the other two freedoms that I put in my list of five, uh, and they are the freedom of self-determination, which Luther has when he does act from a will that he had formed earlier, the freedom of self-determination, uh, and uh, the um, um, the last one I call the freedom of self-formation, which is what we we do when we engage in, in self-forming actions. Okay, now his this is interesting, how it just occurred to me, as a matter of fact. We ought to have these conversations more often. Uh, hey, if, the, if this didn't record, we'll have to do it again. <laughs> I, all right. Okay. <laughs> but anyway. Cold your uh, bluff. Yeah, well, it just, it just occurred to me that um, the saints in heaven, like Senate says, uh, this just sounds to me very astute, uh, they would have the freedom of self-perfection. And that is a legitimate freedom. But they would also have what I, what I call the libertarian freedom of self-determination because that's what Luther had when he was determined to do the, the right thing here that he thought was the right thing because he had formed himself in such a way that he would do that. But, and that, that would be, something that, be, that, 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 would be something that God wouldn't have, though. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting, and that depends on the view you have about God. And that's another complicated business. Um, if your view is uh, of God being eternal and unchanging, right. and whatever, then then you're absolutely right, uh, and that will be a problem. When I think about religious issues, and I sometimes do for a little philosophy of religion, I'm inclined to think that the idea of God as an eternal and totally unchanging being is. Uh, uh, Incoherent. So I'll you have open theist. Uh, I am definitely an open, definitely an open theist, but I even incline to uh, the idea that God develops and changes. Uh, and uh, they could get not, burnt at the stake in some period. Well, I was inf influenced in talking with this with with Charles Hartson, who was a colleague here for thirty years, and he's of course big on this. And Charles. Uh, uh, like to say uh, that um, uh, God can change, but oh, oh, God is perfect in the sense that God is unsurpassable by anything else but Himself, uh, and so He can get better and better. <laughs> uh, uh, but He develops and changes. Uh, but the new idea that you're suggesting to me is that. The thought, the original thought would be, well, the only freedom people could have in, in heaven would be freedom of self-perfection, which is, by the way, a compatibilist freedom. Uh, but they could also have the, if, if the conception of heaven is what I think it ought to be if there is such a thing, mm -hmm. uh, is one in which people earn it, and therefore, they would also have in heaven what I call the freedom of self-determination. Because that's the freedom you have if you always act from a good will, but you have been the one who created that good will. Yes, and that, that is essentially Senate. That's, that's a new thought I had about that. Yeah, so he wants to say that's why you have to have the earth. You have to have the earth as this... Now, of course, there's all kinds of problems have with this. this. Have another freedom. Yeah. There, there's all kinds of problems with this. I mean, the first we've already said it might be that God doesn't have this. So can it really be that great if God doesn't have it? Right, and, exactly. And That's the second one is, well, what about uh, what about babies that die before whenever their first self-forming action is, whether it be two or earlier? What about if they die before that? Are they yeah. little angel automatons un yeah. incapable of? of this yeah. kind of uh, self-formation. As I said, that's why I like to stay away from uh, philosophy of religion to the degree that I can. I have thoughts about it. I have my own, uh, my own beliefs. Uh, but uh, I think we know uh, as much about these things as the cavemen knew about the stars anyway. So one has to be very cautious. 
but uh, it does seem to me that Senate's on the right track here if they really did get into the question of heaven, except that it suddenly occurred. It always occurred to me that the freedom God would have would be a freedom of self-perfection, uh, uh, but it, and so the saints in heaven, uh, uh, if there were such. And, uh, but it never occurred to me that uh, they would also have the freedom of self-determination, as I define it in there. Uh, uh, just as Luther would have had, he got to a point where he always did good, um, because uh, that would be, they would have formed themselves, and as you, you nicely put it, uh, that would be a reason for having an earth, them on earth, uh, having them in the universe, uh, developing themselves. That's very, very interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't completely thought that through before, but I think it is quite an interesting thought. Maybe you should write a paper on it. <laughs> Already done. Um. <laughs> Actually, I, I just finished editing a book called Philosophy of Heaven, so you can uh, you can check well, that out. I are into this. There is a big debate about this, about whether uh, we don't have liberty and free will in heaven, and people have t been taking different sides. I, I know Kevin Timpey and a few other people and have Paul, been. Paul and Timpey had a paper on that. Where P -A -W -L, yeah, that. Yes, and uh, they, uh, they want to build on Senate's view, but give uh, the saints in heaven the ability to choose between singing uh, to praise God and playing the trumpet to praise God. So it's a little bit like, uh, you know, it's, yeah, a limited it's, I see, menu. Yeah, I, I, I see. It seems to me all these people on, on, uh, on the right track here, uh, but it's a problem beyond my scope. <laughs> To resolve, but I think it's a very, very interesting. And you're writing a, you're doing a. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's called uh, Heaven and Philosophy. It'll be, it's uh, we finished the manuscript. It just has to be typeset now. Right. right. Well, um, uh, there's another side of this, and that is because I oppose the idea that free will is a is an all or nothing thing, you know, for reasons we've given with the scientific orientation and the extent to which I have a very strong feeling about how much we are determined by our heredity and environment and so on. Uh, because I hold uh, that, uh, I reject things like my colleague, who's now my colleague, but I've been in contact and, just, and in interaction with his thought for many, many years, Galen Strawson, uh, uh, Peter Strawson's son, uh, Galen is now my colleague, in fact, his office down the hall. Uh, in fact, he has my, he, for a while he had my old office. That was a very strange experience. <laughs> but uh, Galen had always talked about uh, libertarian freedom as a quote unquote heaven and hell freedom. Uh, but on my view, you can leave the hell out of it. Uh, I'll go with purgatory or something like that, where you wear it off, you know, uh, by acting good and doing good. But hell, no way, because that's infinite. Given the great limitations I've talked about in terms of our actual free will and the deeper sense of responsibility, you can see why the idea of hell as an infinite uh, suffering for finite wrongs is way, way off base. So I would reject that. Uh, uh, You're a case. universalist. Well, uh, no, well, it, universalism doesn't necessarily follow um, if you have a purgatorial conception. True, but the point of purgatory is that eventually you leave it. Well, no, but it might be that if, uh, that if the evil is so great and the uh, redemption ineffective, you just cease to exist. Yeah, there, there is that option. There's, that's a possibility. I, I don't, I don't know what the answer is to these things, but I, but it's just it's something worth speculating about. Okay, I want but, to um, uh, do two things uh, in because we've already talked for a long time, but I do want I to. Thinking, by the way, when I said that, I was thinking of Hitler or, or, the, or his. Uh, right, <laughs> right. Hitler is always. Uh, it is always the one that, yeah, as uh, I saw a comedian, the comedian Bill Burr uh, mused about this and he says, uh, you know, it's, it's unfair on all these people who killed more than Hitler. Why, why don't those kills count? Everybody just talks about Hitler. Um, right. right. Uh, but the, no, I, I want to do two things. One is I, I want to ask one more thing about 
um, plural voluntary concert, uh, uh, control. Uh, and then after that, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, more recent book, which is oh, yeah. this one. The Because uh, there's an awful lot to say about this. It, it just so happens that I'm much more familiar with your free will stuff, uh, which right. is why well, I, I focus on that. I'm glad, I'm glad you showed that book. It came out in 2010, and I'm very proud of that book. I think I think the thoughts in it are, uh, are uh, equally important to my free will thing. And and I, it struck I, me I that it, more discussion of it. It struck me that that is uh, that this is sort of a throwback to your origins because you always had these pluralistic concerns, and this Where is, is this thought? is a grand theory in the kind of Spinoza tradition. Absolutely, it uh, which people it, don't do that, anymore. The connection with my free will book is is the idea of pluralism of values. Uh, uh, that there can be ambivalence, ambivalence, so to speak, in human life, and there's a plurality of, of values that will work. And, and that's a, the whole question of pluralism of values is so central to a lot of modern discussions of ethics. Does it mean relativism or, or what can we do with it? And that's one of the themes of my book. That's the connection between, uh, the only, really only connection between the free will, my free will discussion and other, because I make the pluralism of, of of values crucial to my my theory of free will too, but I I I, I appreciate your comments about that book because I really uh, like it and I'm writing more about it. I just wrote a paper on uh, relating the ideas in that book to political philosophy as well. well. So uh, so it's really an interesting topic. Go ahead. Yeah. Please. So the, just the the one more thing about plural voluntary concern, uh, control. So. Uh, and I brought this up uh, in our previous talk, which is lost to posterity because of uh, computer problems. But um, it, so your businesswoman, imagine your businesswoman. Uh, the example of your uh, self-forming action is uh, the choice between uh, helping or going on to the meeting. Now, um, the re one of the reasons why I brought up the James Senate thing is because this is supposed to be a, a very much uh, moral character forming. So, so the religious people who draw on your idea want to say that the self-forming actions can't just be between cauliflower and broccoli, uh, you know, for dinner. It has to be between a good action and a bad action. There has to be real, genuine moral choice. So let's say there is that. But what you say uh, by the is... Way the way that isn't quite true but let's just assume it for the okay it isn't um, yeah. let's assume it for the sake right so now the way uh, you you present it is she should endorse whichever results because there's genuine ambivalence in her self as it were in her will and, and both of the different com conflicting emotions are very important to her right but uh, certainly but which one is actualized, to use, uh, you know, language from possible world talk, to, uh, Alvin Plantinga uh, likes to use that terminology, um, the one which is actualized in the real world as we know it, in our world, uh, is uh, undetermined because of these quantum indeterminacies. So, if it, suppose it turns out so now let's imagine, and this is my thought experiment, let's imagine these two branching uh, selves. So we, we start out with the businesswoman, and then right. businesswoman A in, in one world makes the right choice, or at least uh, it, because of indeterminacy, the choice that is actualized is the one where she helps. And that right. helps to... I would, I would not use the phrase because of indeterminacy. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't really make of... sense, but... Right. right. Uh, there's determinacy involved, but you want not you want it not to be the cause. Okay, so it's not uh, it is not that, determined by herself that she will make that choice. It's not determined antecedently by herself yes. that that's the choice she must make. Okay, but it is determined by herself when she makes it. Uh, all right. Uh, now, uh, so in world one, let's say she makes the good choice, she helps, and then she becomes a super amazing person and she keeps, she makes the best choice in every self-forming action. And let's say, you know, you're, you're wrong about heaven, there is a heaven and a hell, she ends up in heaven. Whereas right. in world B, 
uh, she makes the wrong choice and uh, and and it's sort right. of the worst it, it's the extremes of the tree so uh, we're on in one world uh, it makes the best choice every time and in the other it makes the best second choice. now the different i want to say here's me being uh for the sake of argument the difference between heavenly businesswoman and hellish businesswoman is luck now uh, and of course you are definitely opposed to that but I uh, but I'm going to present it in the in, in the most serious objection that you can then respond to. It is uh, there is no difference between the, uh, the it's the same original self that results in both of these things. They both come from the same tree, and the only difference is I want to say randomness or luck, but you don't like those terms. <laughs> That's what we have. To, we have to avoid the conclusion that the difference is randomness. Yeah. There are in any other place. Now, first of all, we, we've got to get clear here that these would be, if you have a lot of branching trees here, where she could go in future. Uh, if you have a lot of branching trees here, the two you gave are extreme at the outer limits. Right. There's a lot of things in here. We, you know, right. all my choices now are bad, and I go down to hell right. and. I just, no, no, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of, she's got a future, and she has a chance to redeem herself. She may uh, feel uh, pangs of conscience when she goes on to the meeting uh, and the resolves to change uh, later on, and then, then she does have other choices later on. So we have many of these going on, uh, and we have development over time. So these would be the extreme uh, cases. That's, that's the first thing to say. But now we want to get to the basic thing here, which is that you're absolutely right. There's a, a thought here that it's a matter of luck. I mean, you can do it in a more elementary way, as Al Mealy and other critics do, by talking about the same person or their counterpart in another possible world in exactly the same situation. And one goes this way, one goes the other, and it's a matter of chance and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of ways to put it. You put it in a very nice way. Uh, so you've got to deal with this. This is where the whole plural voluntary control thing gets into the picture because it looks like it's, it's a matter of chance and therefore a matter of luck uh, which way the person will go here if it's undetermined. And, and this required a lot of work for me over the years. Uh, and I introduced at this point perhaps the most controversial feature of my view, which is that I imagine in self-forming action situations uh, that a person is making uh, efforts to make each of their conflicting values prevail over the other, okay? So that the deliberative process isn't, it has sub-processes within it. The little angel and the little devil? What, whatever, uh, so that uh, she really wants to go on to her meeting and she wants to resist the temptation to help, actually, because she so wants to go on to her meeting. And she has to make an effort to make those motives, those ambitious motives, prevail. Some people, when they talk about weakness of will, always put it in a one-sided way, uh, that you have to make an effort to make the moral thing prevail over the other. But I say uh, we can be making an effort to make our selfish instincts prevail over our moral ones many times in life, and let's not kid ourselves about that, right? Yeah, you could be saying, stop being a sap. You're always uh, sabotaging your chances of promotion. sabotaging your career yeah. here over a morality because you have images of your mother screaming at you or something, you know, uh, and th that's silly, you know. So, so what I imagine is that uh, uh, there are, we are making a plural efforts in self-forming choice situations. One effort uh, caused by the motives for the moral side uh, is being made because efforts have to be made whenever there is resistance that has to be overcome. And in this case, there's two-way resistance in the will. Either way, well, then you've got to have an effort to try to, if there's two resistances to both, you've got to make an effort to, to, to have either one prevail, right? So I imagine plural efforts here. Now, some people say, well, we're not conscious of plural efforts, and I have a whole response to that. Uh, this is a theory about what may be going on underneath 
when we are torn in this way. It's not a phenomenology. And as a matter of fact, my argument is that if, if we tried to figure out what free will really was uh, on the surface, phenomenologically or consciously, it would, it would always appear to be a mystery, as it always has in history. We have to have a theory about what's going on underneath. And that's uh, what I argue here. So that's it's, Sellers again. You're coming back to Sellers. I am. I, it's interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that way, but indeed it is. We have to have a theory here and that has some scientific viability. We can't prove it to be true, but, but the fact is, in other words, we have, uh, um, I postulate parallel processing in the free decision-making brain. And we know there's parallel processing on the input side of the ledger in perception. Why not consider parallel processing on the outside of uh, on the output side of the of the ledger on in deliberation choice and action I, and i say that's what we have to imagine to make sense of libertarian free will so anyway when we look at the deliberative process it would look like hey look it would be, it would look like flipping a coin oh well i'm deliberating i have thoughts for this side thoughts for that side we come to the end and it's at the end it's it's chance. <laughs> it's some indeterminism that chooses one way or the other. That seems no better than flipping a coin, right? But my thought is, let's put um. That's because you imagine the whole past is like a big bubble, includes everything prior to the moment, as when you define determinism, and of course it includes my whole psychological past. Historically, some libertarians have tried to keep your psychological past out of it. That's dualism, right? But no, I, no way. It's in there. The whole past, same psychological past, two agents have exactly the same past. Uh, one of them does this, one of them does that. How could it be anything else but chance? Okay. Well, I have, I say, put a microscope on that whole past because that deliberative process preceding is very complex and it involves a whole host of sub processes. And among these sub processes are these volitional streams, which I call efforts. Uh, uh, you could also call them exercises of willpower. Uh, and you put the microscope on there and you see how oh, we have these two different streams. So in the one world where you choose one thing, uh, there's a different narrative to the story than in the other world, even though, uh, I, and I don't even think the pasts were the same because I have a reasons for saying that, uh, but I have mistakenly said that in the past. I don't think the pasts are exactly the same. They don't have to be, uh, but leave that aside for the moment. Uh, in one world, you have the following narrative, that the person was trying to make the moral choice by resisting the temptation to do the ambitious choice, and they succeeded. And then that is very much like many examples that come down from Austin and Anscombe, where they emphasize that if you do something, if you are trying to do something, like sink a putt, right, and you do so, even though it was undetermined and you might have failed, you did it, you're responsible for it, it's your agency, it was done by you. Uh, even, though even though it was undetermined. Moreover, Moreover the indeterminism there, since it was internal to the effort, is not the cause, because the, on probability theory, the cause of a probabilistic event um, has to raise the probability that will occur, not lower it. And in this case, the indeterminism lowers the probability that it will occur. What raises the probability is your prior motives that are in, inclining you to do it and the effort you are making to do it. Those things are the things, if, if without them, there'd be no chance you did it. Uh, and so the indeterminism, I say, is not the cause. It's involved causally, but it's not the cause. It's like the vaccination that didn't prevent the disease um, in probabilistic causation. Uh, so on, on the narrative on this side, you have this person struggling to overcome the uh, uh, selfish motives and succeeding. They're responsible. They did it. They did it voluntarily. 
they did it intentionally. They, they certainly did it on purpose. They were making an effort to do it. Uh, uh, and they, it was rational because the motives that caused it and brought it about were the motives for doing the moral thing. The motives for doing the other thing didn't come into it. This, this sounds kind of Manichaean to me. You know what I mean? You know, it is. Be, well, you know, that's, that's an interesting point. You're, you're raising a lot of points I hadn't thought about here before. But this is really true. Do you want to elaborate well, on that? Well, you have uh, the, the dark and the light uh, are both acting within you. And when you do good, it's because the light went, won out. And when you do bad, it's because right. the, the, the dark right. won out. Okay, all right, very good. Yeah, this is interesting. Quantum you know. Manichaeanism. Yeah, quantum Manichaeanism, interesting. Yeah, well, the thing about Manichaeanism, of course, this, they put the same thing into God and the universe, you know, there's the good and the evil part. But when you think about it in terms of human beings, we have our bad nature and we have our good nature. And we are divided in that way. The only dis disagreement I would have is that the bad nature is like something that isn't me, and it does it and not me. <laughs> uh, and the good nature is something that isn't me, and it doesn't me. That part of the Manichaean thing, I'm not mine here, uh, because I am saying that it is us if we are self-formed, but even if we are uh, making, uh, you know, even if we are determined to have these two things, it is us because we are the ones that bring about one thing. It isn't sort of, oh, it was the devil in me. <laughs> That's a cop-out, I think. Uh, or, you know, it was the good in me or whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's something Manichaean here in the sense that we, to, to be a self-forming agent and to have free will, you have to be at times in your life, in fact, at many times, a very divided person. Okay. Now, one other thing you mentioned earlier that I want to speak to uh, is that this is not all, all a matter of moral versus non-moral choices. I list in my significance of free will five or six different contexts. Yeah, I mean that that's really the uh, that's really the 1996. So that goes way back. It's 20 years now. Wow. It really covers everything, but it doesn't give the whole story because I've refined many things since. But it's still a, a very good book. I may say so. so. Anyway, I d distinguish about five or six things in there. Sometimes I go back and I see my goodness that I make those distinctions. Uh, but uh, I, I just five or six. So first of all, you've got the moral versus the self-interest. Those are the ones we always think about and use as examples, actually. But also, you've got prudential choices. Uh, where you're thinking about the long-term girl, should, should I eat this piece of pie now or have the extra drink, trying to lose weight? That could be an SFA, right? Then there are things for which you have aversions. Oh my God, my wife wants me to mow the lawn. God damn it. Oh, in <laughs> Texas, in the summer? Yeah, I, right. And uh, sometimes just getting out of bed in the morning after a long, you know, dreary night. Uh, so things that you have aversions to, and overcoming those aversions, uh, I think they all can be. So there's three different things that could be SFAs. Uh, I also imagine other SFAs that are strictly practical, actually, where people are making decisions. What field should I go into? Uh, what choices of career should I make? Who should I marry? Should we have children? Uh, these, I take to be self form can be very much definitely self-forming actions, and they change what we will become, depending on what we choose. To have children, I mean, let's face it, uh, makes you a different kind of person than you would be if you, you didn't. Oh, yeah. Right? So, this is self-formation. So I add that into the mix too. Practical choices like that. I use some examples there about uh, a, a woman uh, graduating from law school, deciding whether she wants to join a large firm in Chicago or a small firm in Austin. Uh, and well, okay, so she has she has choices here, and and there may be good reasons for each, and she's torn. Um, but also, there are limitations on what she can choose. I mean. Being a topless dancer in Seattle doesn't enter into it, you know, so you, you're limited, but it, it does, it's going to determine, it will determine what law firm she goes into, what sort of person I think she becomes too. 
and who you marry and God. So I, so there's five. I think I made a sixth and seventh even in the significance. I can't remember, but at least those five different ones. So the moral ones are only one way in which we form ourselves. And I think that's important to make that point. Okay. Well, we've, we've been talking for so long. See if you can give a five to 10 minute summary of the high points of this, because I, I don't think we have time to do it justice, but I do want you to uh, say a little bit about what you think the key ideas are here. Right. Well, it's an attempt. It's called uh, um, the, the extent the extent to which uh, we can uh, accept the idea that there are plural values uh, without getting into relativism and while arguing that there may be some values that are objectively objectively good and objectively right. Uh, and it's an, that, that's, of course, a standard kind of thing. In ethics, there's nothing new about, about the problem. Uh, but I approach, it, I approach it in a different way. And I, now, now I'm, I have to really remind myself. Well, it's the, the key notions that you want to touch on are the moral sphere and these four dimensions. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You see, so I introduce a version of Kant's principle of treating others as ends. And so the ends on. principle, so, as you call it? I call it the ends principle. That's right. And it defines a moral sphere. It is a moral sphere exists when uh, uh, everybody in it, it may be a small group or it may be the, uni uh, you know, the whole uh, world. Uh, a moral sphere exists when it's possible for everyone to treat everyone else in that group uh, as an end rather than a means. Uh, uh, in other words, and I, I have a more elaborate account of what it means to treat as an end, it's to afford them openness, respect, allowing them to pursue their purposes and their way of life without interference or subordination to you or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, that notion of openness, respect plays a key role, I think also in political philosophy. Uh, but. Uh, uh, so a moral sphere is one in which everyone in the sphere can treat everyone else with a uh, uh, as a uh, an end uh, in this sense uh, with openness respect uh, and uh, it doesn't necessarily require that you have what Darwell makes a distinction between recognition respect and appraisal respect. It doesn't mean that you appraise the way they live or their plans of action or what they they do and you think it's great or excellent or anything of the sort. Openness respect is a recognition respect, namely that they have the right to live it unless, unless of course, they live their life in such a way as to prevent anybody else in that sphere from doing this. And that's where the ethical part gets into this story, see. Uh, a moral sphere breaks down when somebody acts in such a way uh, that they make it impossible for others to pursue their plans of action and their ways of life uh, without uh, interference and constraint. Uh, as well. And uh, I go back to my, it's not exactly my businesswoman example, but it's similar. A person uh, uh, seeing an assault taking place in an alley. The moral reason for doing something about it is that the moral sphere has broken down in the sense in which I define it, right? Uh, this person can either walk on by, in which case there's going to be a person in that sphere uh, where you could have an influence that's going to, that's not going to be treated with openness respect, namely the victim. If you, however, interfere, there's going to be someone who's not treated with openness respect, maybe the perpetrator. And if, if the police or others come in and they stop, there's going to be some. So the moral sphere is broken down, and moral sphere breaks down when it's impossible to treat everyone with openness respect, no matter what you do. Uh, and and, and then the argument is, a lot of complication here, but the argument is, the idea is when the moral sphere breaks down, the moral thing to do is to restore the moral sphere again, 
in this case, by stopping the one who has broken it and made it impossible for everyone else to be so treated. And I think if you pursue that line, you get a whole moral theory. Uh, and, and, and you get uh, a, a good sense of morality. There's a lot more complication that has to come into it here. Uh, but uh, that would be the idea. Uh, and, uh, and so that morality would break down. Now I have spheres of moral sphere breakdown. So, so you imagine a circle in the middle. This is the moral sphere. This is where everybody can treat everyone else. Uh, with uh, respect. Some people say, well, gee, in, in life, we're never in a, uh, in a moral sphere because we're always encountering... The there are assholes problems. everywhere. Yeah, there are assholes everywhere, that's right. But it, it isn't just human conflict that counts. For, for example, uh, if, some, if, a, if a repairman comes to my, my door and so on, in a certain sense, we are using each other as means. Uh, but we aren't breaking the moral sphere in my sense because he's pursuing his way of life and what he wants as long as he gets paid for doing his work. He's pursuing his life and I'm pursuing mine, getting my toilet oh, to work. Oh, I can see Mark. I can just hear the Marxists pulling their hair out here. Yeah, well, okay, there you go. <laughs> interesting, interesting point. So uh, it isn't just conflict here, but it's conflict where you are not willing to compromise, but rather... Uh, force your will on the other. I, I talk about uh, my, a neighbor here who has to work all night and sleeps during the day and the other neighbor it plays in a band and he's practicing his trumpet. Right. And so, okay, it's alright if they find a way. I sleep here and you do it then uh, rather than the guy runs over here and smashes the trumpet, which he might do. If it was okay, so that, pipes, then that would be justified. Okay, okay. so um, so there are several stages of the moral sphere, and the way I put it, in the moral sphere here, everybody can treat everyone else uh, uh, in this way, with openness and respect. The first level of moral sphere breakdown is when there's conflict, so that it's quite impossible for everybody to get everything they want. Uh, uh, th this is like the, uh, the, the neighbors here with the horn and the whatever. And the idea in that second sphere, this is the conflict of interest sphere, is that a moral sphere is clearly broken down because both of them are having trouble pursuing their way of life as they would like. Uh, so when the moral sphere breaks down in a conflict situation, the idea to restore it is to find a compromise which allows each to the degree possible to go on pursuing their plans of action and ways of life without interference. And that's what they do if they find a compromise. Uh, if, the, if they can't compromise and one guy comes over and breaks the trumpet, then you move to a third sphere. And this is really where you have uh, uh, moral sphere breaking actions, treating persons as means. Because you now some, somebody decides to resolve the conflict by imposing their will on the other side, much as the uh, assailant did in the alley. Uh, and they then have broken the moral sphere, uh, made it impossible for other people involved to treat them with respect and everyone else too. Now, by the way, I relate this to Kant's famous murderer at the door. On this theory, it's insane to tell the truth to the murderer at the door just because he's a human being. Uh, uh, because you have to look at what plan of action he is pursuing here. He's, break, he's going to make it impossible for all of us to treat everyone, himself or the victim, uh, as a means here. And that's why I sort of part company with Kant, assuming that's what he holds, there's some debate, of course. Uh, but uh, so my view is, for example, uh, with regard to Kant, is my end principle differs from the uh, Categorical imperative, the second form, by the fact that um, we don't owe everybody uh, openness and respect simply because they are rational beings or capable of choosing their own ends. It depends on what ends they choose. And they are not worthy of respect independently of the ends they choose. And if those ends make it impossible for others, to pursue uh, their own ends, uh, then uh, they are not worthy of respect to that degree anymore. <coughs> so, when you get to that stage, uh, you restore the sphere by stopping the person who's broken it, and then you're back to the moral sphere again. Uh, 
But now, I imagine at the extreme, the fourth sphere, but it isn't a sphere, is where your attempt to find compromise doesn't work, so to speak, and war breaks out, <laughs> right? Uh, that fourth sphere is basically a Hobbesian state of nature. I was going to say that uh, actually this, this whole notion that in some sense we have, it's a, a cooperation, coordination problem to create the world of morality. It sounds very Hobbesian, uh, a very Hobbesian project. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. I'll have to think about that more. But of course, it's not really Hobbes <laughs> in terms of his whole political theory and 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 the rest of it and so on. But it is it, it's interesting to call it a coordination problem. It sort of is. But that that we are in some sense that the the very possibility of morality is uh, is made is a function of coordinated activity by individuals right 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 uh, that's true that's good and I'll have to uh, I'll have to think more about that when you get to that fourth stage you have a Hobbesian state of nature and it may be that you know if it's two countries or something uh, it may just be impossible and it's going to be war or it's going to be something some kind of subordination we see that in the world today yes everywhere. we don't want to look Right, but I, I, that's so. That's the structure of the moral theory, uh, and, and the key thing is that you're not worthy of the respect which is being granted here, irrespective of how you act and whether you respect others. Now that means that worthiness for respect or being treated as an end or for moral treatment as a human being is going to depend on how you treat other human beings. All right, that fo that follows here, and uh, and that's really sort of my argument. If you wish to be worthy of respect, uh, deserving of respect, uh, uh, you got to respect others in this way. And the degree to which you do not do that, you are not worthy of respect from them. And if you are, if you are not worthy of respect for them, you are not objectively worthy of respect. Because what objective worthiness for respect means is being worthy of respect from everybody, no matter whether they give it to you or not. And that's what objective worth is. I have a, a whole chapter on the notion of objective worth in that. And objective worth is worth from all points of view. And in order to have such worth, moral worth from all points of view, you got to be respectful of all other points to the degree that you can. Mm -hmm. all, you know what I say. Uh, and there's there's your morality here. There's your justification, so to speak. We get objective worth out of this. Uh, and my chapter on objective worth uh, is um, interesting because I I define several kinds of it, but it is fundamentally worth from all points of view. Now, uh, you call this ethics and the quest for wisdom. Yeah, uh, that's I was going to put the wisdom in there. Which, um, yeah. I mean, do you see this as sort of a throwback to uh, kind of ancient ph philosophical concerns? I mean, is this a reinvigorating yes, yes. philosophy as it was practiced in the Athenian yeah. you know, yeah, square? It is, it, is, it is, but it is not exactly like the reversion of various eth virtue ethicist theories going back to Aristotle and the Greeks and so on, although I have nothing against that. Having virtues is going to be related. If you don't have certain virtues, you're not going to keep the moral sphere going here. Uh, and so I have nothing against virtue ethics, but I just don't think it's the whole story. It is a reversion here, and uh, it's going back to when I give my chapter on wisdom, I say that I go back to Aristotle and I define wisdom as uh, um, knowing what's worth believing about the nature of things and that's subjective reality, objective knowledge, and knowing what's worth striving for in the nature of things. That's what I call objective worth or value or whatever you want to call it here. Uh, and uh, uh, these are the two uh, objects of ancient wisdom, 
as Aristotle defines it, Sophia, in the metaphysics and his other works. Uh, and so I use Aristotle here as a key to the notion of wisdom. But I, I, I don't talk, well, I don't talk necessarily about what the many ethicists call practical wisdom in Aristotle's sense, phronesis. Uh, that's in there, as I say, because virtue ethics and all that. I'm all, all right with that. But I'm interested in Sophia when I say wisdom in the title of that book. But wisdom is interested not just in objective understanding of the universe. Uh, met that's metaphysics, basically. That was Aristotle's word for metaphysics, wisdom, Sophia. Uh, but also objective worth, what's worth striving for in the nature of things. Now for Aristotle and for the ancients, that converged. Because if you understood the structure of nature since it was based on final causes, then you would know what was objectively worth striving for right. in the nature. We cut that apart here, but I'm trying, but I'm trying to put them back together. Let's get both stages of wisdom here: objective knowledge and objective worth. And of course, the ethics part is going to focus on objective worth. So I begin to ask myself: Well, what is it to have objective worth? The kind of worth that should be recognized by everybody, whether it is or not. Uh, for example, the truth on the uh, epistemic side of this equation, objective knowledge, objective reality, the truth is defined as uh, that which should be recognized as true by everybody, though clearly it isn't. Uh, that's the objective truth. That anyone who affirms it is right and anyone who doesn't is wrong, so that it is worthy of being objectively recognized by all. And I say objective worth is uh, the good uh, and the right way of living that's worthy of being recognized as good by all. It, it isn't necessarily, but it's worthy of it. It's worth, objective worth. And, and and I I say that well I leave it to science to find out this one here or philosophy I suppose too because it because Aristotle meant that's what he meant by metaphysics uh, but I I focus on the this side and I say you know following the reasoning we just went through on the moral sphere and so on that if you want to uh, uh, find out what's worth striving for in the nature of things and what will make your life, whatever you do, objectively worthy, that is worthy of being recognized as good from all points of view, which is, then you will have found it. You must act within the moral sphere. <laughs> wow, well, it's certainly a, a, an amazing project, but uh, you know, it seems pretty clear to me that A.J. Eyre didn't take that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that is that is truly uh, that's truly fascinating. Yes, indeed. I mean, logical positivism was a kind of a spur because it sort of said, "No, these philosophical problems—they're all pseudo problems." Uh, and the other thing about pluralism and value in here uh, is uh, is my wife has pointed this out to me. I grew up in a small New England town uh, outside of Boston uh, called Maynard. It's not very well known, but it's right next to Concord, Mass. Uh, and my uncle in past times was an immigrant from Italy uh, and uh, my father was an immigrant from uh, Newfoundland but uh, actually uh, uh, Ireland but he was for several generations in Newfoundland they called in New England they called them Newfies right. uh, and I once said that I was Newfie in this respect and I only met one other philosopher who claimed that his ancestry was Newfie as well and that was Quine Oh, really? Well, it said that, oh. yeah. And he's the only other one. But in any case, my father was on that side. My, my father on the Italian side owned a farm that bordered down on White's Pond, which was the sister pond to Walden. So this is sort of this area. But the main thing about Maine it is, it was cut out from all these towns, Acton, Concord, and whatever, that sent militia to the Concord Bridge to meet the British, you know, in the poem and all. Uh, because there were factories there, and the Yankees wanted to keep in the outer towns, which were more rural and and nice, and all the immigrants kept piling into this town that was cut out of them in the middle. And that's the town I grew up in. It was a huge woolen mill that uh, functioned until it moved south in the 50s. You know how that went. Uh, and. Uh, 
there were oh, at least 12 to 15 different languages spoken in that town. Uh, and there were every kind of church imaginable. There were a couple of different Catholic churches, uh, the Polish one and the Ca Irish Italian one, and, and there was even some kind of uh, there was synagogue, uh, every Protestant denomination, and there was even some kind of I don't know whether it was Eastern Orthodox. It might have even been a mosque for all I know. Uh, but there were 15 different languages spoken. It was pluralist, and I. It was very difficult because they always used to tell ethnic jokes about each other and talk about how. Oh, I don't know. I can't get along with these Polacks. So you know, these Dagos are dangerous and all this. But there was always this line that was spoken at a town meeting because they had town meetings. It was New England after all. Uh, this sort of Italian guy got up at a town meeting and said, well, I can't stand them and those and whatever and so on. He said, but this is America. We all have to learn to get along with one another. And that was the story. It was funny how they all struggled to try to make it work uh, throughout all these different language things. My grandmother used to take me to a movie. Uh, on Tuesday nights, and she couldn't understand, she was Italian, she couldn't understand English, so she would always leave 15 minutes earlier before the end of the movie. I was only five, so it didn't matter. And took me down first to the Jewish grocer and then the uh, Italian grocer, and uh, and uh, by the time I got to be six or seven, she had to drag me out, of course. Uh, but uh, it's amazing. I don't know how she communicated with the Jewish grocer. She was an Italian, he was in some kind of Yiddish or whatever and so on. But that was the way it was. And my wife reminded me in later life, you know, that's where you got your thing on pluralism. And I think she's absolutely right. So there you go about about youth and history. And, then, and at the same time, I'm reading H.A. Ayer. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> what a confused young man, huh? <laughs> well, it worked out well for you. Yeah, well, anyway, it was great. All right, well, and, thanks, Bob. I really want to thank you because, uh, as I said, this is the second time you did this because uh, I have lost the, the recording didn't take the first time. and Well, I'm glad I enjoyed it just as much as the first. Uh, and, and indeed, I straightened out a few more things. And, and I learned a number of things that I got to look into from your comments. So that's, uh, that's really terrific. Maybe we'll do it again in a couple of years. And, yeah, hopefully. And you'll, that be, you'll have written another I, book by then. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> All right, thanks okay. a lot, Bob. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. I love your project. Thank you. We'll see you. Bye, Bob.